Uh, he is still using the same old line that he used back in Genesis. You shall be as gods, yeah. deciding for yourself good and evil. The King James Version says knowing good and evil, but the word means deciding for yourself what is good or evil or bad for you. That's been mankind's problem all along. It is still his problem. We want to decide for ourselves. We don't want the Lord or his word deciding for us. We shall be as gods, Satan said to Eve. You shall be as gods. Get to decide for yourself. Well, you know that we all get in trouble when we start deciding for ourselves, don't we? So it, it is, it is uh, what we do and how we, uh, how we are challenged and how we live our life. And then we... We took considerable time to demonstrate what it means to love one another, the one another principle, what that looks like, how a church ought to function, how the people of God ought to function. <coughs> in our attitude, in our response, in our actions toward one another, and there was a lot that the scripture has to say in the New Testament about that well jesus summed it up this way he says the world's going to know that you're my disciples because you have loved one to another i think the greatest damage that is done is that those who name the name of christ in the world have so many factions and divisions and divisiveness and disunity and um Sometimes uh, we, we, even at Pentecost, have played our part in that. Um, I'm not sure this is going to work for me. Which, which battery did we use? One of the big ones? Yeah. Oh, no, this one ought to work. I can talk loud enough. I'll just, I'll just take it off and talk loud. Thank you. That's the good battery. Um, it is a it's it's a diff, it's a it's a challenge, and I understand we who understand the new birth. It is a challenge, and I, I get asked this about when I'm talking to people about our faith. You'll, they'll want to bring up the hypotheticals, or they want to bring up grandma, grandpa, great grandma, and grandpa. Where do they stand? I always bring it to this point when I'm speaking to someone about that. Look, I'm going to leave your grandma and your grandpa and your mom and dad in the hands of the Lord. Because he's a righteous judge. You'll judge them in all the light that they knew. But see, here's where you are. You now know. You now see. So it's not a question of what your parents, your grandparents, or your friends or neighbors think about this. What are you going to do with the truth that has now been revealed to you. You have a decision to make. So it's now, I always say, <laughs> now you're had. Because <laughs> you can't say, I don't know. I never heard. <laughs> you know, I didn't understand. Now you're had. And I do it with a smile on my face. But it's, it's to point out the fact that when you and I are confronted with truth, then we have a decision to make. Right. We can say yes and go on and grow in Christ, or we can say no and reject it and walk away. I will tell you that, I believe it's in one of the Psalms, he says, if you rebel against the light that you have, you will be given no more light. Right. Amen. Look, if you don't pass second grade, why go to third? If you haven't managed to do that and put that together and learn that, then there's no reason to go on any further because it's going to be immaterial and unproductive. So the point is, is that when you and I are confronted with truth, and that's not just basic truth, some of the things that we've been teaching about or been taught, when we are confronted with truth of how we ought to treat others in Christ, then we're had. We can't say we didn't know, we didn't hear, we didn't understand. 
one thing I, 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 I like about series is that we deal with things long enough that hopefully we all understand how it works and what it looks like and uh, how we ought to behave and act and conduct our lives. So tonight I want to take a, a, another step because I'm going to deal with, in the next few weeks, I'm going to deal with some particulars, some specifics. Uh, that deal with our conduct and our behavior in this world. And I hope that as we have layered things in the past, that, you know, here, here are some principles that decide how we ought to conduct our lives. That when we get to some specifics, people will not jump up and, and yell, well, you're, you're, you're being legalistic. Well, I hope I can remedy that aspect of it. Look, Christians ought to be, should be, are required to be the salt and the light to the world. Amen. Now what that means, if you and I are salt and the light, that means there is no salt in this world without you and me. There is no light in this world without you and me. It is our lives. It is how we conduct ourselves, how we live, that reflects the glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. So does it make a difference how a Christian lives? Sure it does. Does it make a difference how we ought to conduct ourselves and how we ought to behave ourselves, not only inside the church when we were talking about loving one another, but also outside the church as a reflection of of the glory and honor to the Lord. Amen. You know, growing up in church, we always kind of made it, well, it, we always want to make every issue heaven or hell issues. You know, if I do this, I go to heaven. If I don't do it, I go straight to hell. I don't pass gold. Don't collect $200. I just bust hell wide open to spread sparks all over eternity. And we had such thinking that, well, you know, if I messed up and failed this week, well, you're not going to make the rapture. <clears throat> Huh? Is there anybody here that's arrived yet? Besides me? I mean, no. No, is there anybody here that's arrived? No, none of us have arrived. You know, if God put the microscope on all our lives, we'd all say, I have a long way to go to be like my Lord. You know, even in the Old Testament, it talks about if a good man you know, if he fall down seven times, yeah. he fell down, but he got back up. Yeah. Right. He kept on going. That pretty much describes the Christian life. Yeah. We sometimes fall down. We sometimes mess up. Yeah. We fail. We don't always behave the way we should. But the, the Lord doesn't open up the back door of his kingdom and give you the left foot of fellowship every time you and I fail. He deals with us as children. Right? So he will correct us. He will love us. You know, when, when my children were young and I had to correct them, I always made them at the end and told them I loved them, made them hug me, I kissed them. <laughs> You know, so that they knew, and here's the thing, here's a good parenting tip. You always separate the behavior from the per from the child. That's right. You're just dis disciplining the behavior. It's what you did, it's what you said. See, a lot of parents will go in and they'll call their kid's name, you stupid, you idiot, you well, and then when they start being idiots and stupid. <coughs> Well, you told them they were. Right. See, it's different than saying you're you're stupid. Well, you can't fix stupid, you heard, right? So they can't fix it. So they're just going to be stupid. It's different than saying a child is, you say, well, you're stupid versus saying what you did was foolish. It's what you did. Now, see, I can change my behavior. I can change foolish and stupid behavior, right? But if I'm stupid, how do I change that? If I'm dumb, if I'm an idiot. So parents have, uh, uh, many times, well, 
say and throw out names to their children and they're basically putting their thumb mark on them and telling them what they are. You'll never amount to anything. You're dumb. You're an idiot. How stupid can you be? See, always separate the behavior because I can change my behavior. Right? But if I am something, it's hard to change that part of it. Well, that's just a tip. Didn't cost you anything. It's right there for everybody. But maybe you might be able to help some other people who, you know, uh, uh, are not understanding uh, what they're actually doing to their children when they call them names. Um, so the, the point I'm trying to make is, is this. God works in our lives. The Bible says there are basically three ways the Lord speaks to us. He speaks to us first and foremost by his word. Somebody says, I don't know what the will of God is. I always tell them, well, go home and pick up your Bible and start reading his will. Because <laughs> right. it's right there. It's there in black and white. You don't have to guess. You don't have to pray about it. Just go home and start reading the will of God because this is his will and testament. The second two ways God speaks to us is dependent upon the first. So it's the word of God. It shall not pass away. It's forever settled. The second way the Lord speaks to us is by his Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about the Holy Ghost teaching us. Jesus said, I'll give you my spirit. It'll be a lead and a guide into all truth. But see, the Spirit has to coincide with the Word. Otherwise, it's not the Holy Spirit. It is another Spirit. Amen. So the, the, the Spirit of the Lord will never tell you and me to do something that's contrary to the Word of God. You ever met those folks that the Holy Ghost tells them everything, even when they go to the bathroom? God tells me everything. And uh, they just fly by the by the seat of things. And and what happens is they they um, I said, well, you know, have you ever read the Word of God? That tells you what to do. You know, the, the Lord will use His Word. He will speak to us and remind us of His Word. He will teach us what? Something independent from the Word? No. He will teach us what is in the Word and give us insight. And understanding to the word. So that's another way the Lord speaks to our lives. The third way, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it tonight, is that he does it through the ministry. He speaks to us through the ministry. Those that God has placed in leadership in the church to speak to our hearts and our lives. And uh, God has a purpose. And, and again, but the ministry has to coincide with the word of God. Um, the Bereans in the book of Acts were no, more noble than some of the other disciples because they examined in the word of God to see if what Apostle Paul was telling them was true or not. So you need to examine the word of God make sure I'm telling you the truth. Amen. And that we're rightly dividing the word of truth. Um the word of God will not, let me just say this, it will be supernatural and there'll be dynamic things that God's word will do through you and mine, through and me. But it's not wild and wacky because God is not a wild and wacky guy. He is a God of order. Amen? Amen. So the church has to be in order because God's a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. Amen. He's not a God that uh, is into real high showmanship it was said they've done a lot of research in recent years about some of the mega churches they've come to the conclusion where these churches are run multiple thousands of people know nothing or little about discipleship about walking with God they go for the worship they go for the drama they go for the fanfare and they go home and know no, nothing about what it means to really walk with God. And that's not my research. That's done by uh, Barna Research. 
So it is important for us to understand God speaks to us by his word. He speaks to us by the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, he speaks to us by the ministry. So let's start with that. I want you to turn. Uh, uh, I have some slides here, but I want you to turn to um, some passages here. Um, let's look at Ephesians, the fourth chapter. We'll begin with... Uh, with verse 8. Wherefore he said when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended what is but he that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above uh, all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave. Everyone say gave. Yeah. So these are gifts that God has given. These are not the only gifts I'm going to mention to you, but these are the leadership and ministry gifts. So he says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And some people will say that's a five-fold ministry, but the word pastors and teachers is actually a combination and mean some of the same thing. And he says, here's the reason he gave these things, these gifts to the church. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they laid in wait to deceive but speaking the truth and love <clears throat> may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ and, from, and whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So here's the uh, <laughs> things that God requires, or God gave these gifts to the church for a purpose. So when you think about uh, the ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, these are gifts that are given to the church for a specific purpose and reason, and he lists those. Number one, for the maturing of the saints. For the maturing of the saints. The Bible says, our King James Version says, perfecting of the saints. Anytime you see the word perfect in the King James Version, it means mature. It means complete. So he says, these gifts of ministry are given to you and me. To help the saints, the people of God, to mature in the faith. Now, the Bible says, know them that labor among you, that they have a good report. It talks about the bishops and the elders and the qualifications for that. It's not part of my message tonight, but there are qualifications for that. Uh, it always uh, uh, amazed me, and I, and I understand that the challenges, but... So many churches will determine the next pastor or the pastor of the next pastor of the church on a weekend message. And I always said, well, if a preacher doesn't have at least one good message that he can preach, then he's good. he's pretty bad. He probably doesn't. But they'll they'll determine things on personality or how it was preached that particular weekend. And sometimes decisions for a future of the church. Is based on one weekend or maybe two weekends without knowing anything else about that person much. Well, that's that's not a good way to make it for a church to make a decision on, on this kind of things. But he says the ministry is there to mature the saints. Second thing he says the work of the ministry. See, my job is to help you do your job. You know, we said that the preacher is the one that does the ministry. That's not true. That's not biblical. It's the people of God that do the ministry. It's the people of God that do the ministry. Every one of you are called to minister in some capacity. It's 
my responsibility. It is the task that God has given me to help you do that. They, uh, they've done studies on, on the role of the pastor and how many roles a pastor takes on. I'd say somewhere around 17, 18 roles that he takes on in, a, in, in many, many cases. Well, God never designed it to be that way because something's going to give. I like what D.L. Moody says, you can have my head or you can have my feet, but you can't have both. In other words, if you want me to come to this pulpit and give you something really good, then you can have that. If you want me running all the time, you can't have both of them. Hello. So I think there's a lot of churches that are suffering simply because people have a wrong view of what the responsibility of a pastor really is, of those that are put in leadership. He said, it is to help you do the work of the ministry. And uh, so the third thing he says, is to edify the body of Christ. Well, that word edify means to build up, Amen. to encourage, to strengthen, to do that. And um, I'm endeavoring to do that. When you think about uh, the Bible says you preach the truth, but you preach the truth in love. You don't use the Bible as a hammer to bash people with. Now, the Word of God's going to challenge us, isn't it? It's going to tell us, it's going to shed light on our life and our lifestyle and where we need to correct things and where we need to grow and all of that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, the, the, the minister is to build up the body of Christ. Build it up. Edify it. Strengthen it. Teach it. Number four, he says to unify the people in faith. You know, anything with two heads is a so you you there has to be someone that God has always designated a leader. Uh, Brother Rick and I were talking, uh, I guess it was yesterday, we were talking about you know Moses and you remember Dathan and Korah who who took their whole crew and 250 elders of the congregation and rose up against Moses. Alright? And here's what they said to Moses. And God never never argued with them about this comment. They said, we're just as holy as you are. God speaks to us just like he talks to you. So why did the ground open up and swallow David and Korah and 250 elders and all their family and all their stuff? You know why? Because Moses was the one God chose. He was the designated leader. God chose Moses. People didn't chose, choose Moses. God chose Moses. And it wasn't that one person was more spiritual or more holy or God talked to them more than somebody. I hope God talks to every one of us. But there has to be leadership in order to bring unity to the body of Christ and to the local assembly. There has to be leadership and direction. And God has uh, uh, appointed that with that. You know, the Bible says in Acts that the Holy Ghost made, Paul said, the Holy Ghost made you overseer. Yeah. It's a calling. So the next thing he says is to unify people in the doctrine. Right. Unify people in the doctrine. I think in the early days of uh, Pentecostalism, um, people were just coming to understand a, a move of the Holy Ghost and light in the scripture. So when they'd get together, you know, Somebody have, there was a lot of prophecy going on. Some of that prophecy was not in accordance to the word of God. And so we got things put in place that, uh, you know, were not unifying as far as the body of Christ was concerned. They were more divisive than they were unifying. But I will tell you, God is not the author of confusion. So if there is confusion, what is the church to do? What are the people of God to do? Well, you get on your knees and we pray until there's a unified spirit. But somebody's got to set the unified doctrine so that we bring everybody into a unified doctrine and understanding what is sound doctrine so that we all can say when it is preached, amen. 
we're all on the same page. Oh, there's some things in the scripture where that we, we will differ on that the Bible is not real clear. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sound, fundamental doctrine that we all can say amen to. Well, God has given the gifts of the ministry to the church to help bring that about. Uh, the sixth thing is to perfect the church or mature the church as a corporate body. Not only to help the individuals in their own personal ministry in the Lord, but to help the, the corporate church the congregation as a whole to mature together. We don't want to leave anybody behind. We want to bring everybody forward. And so the the uh, the ministry is called to do that. And then finally he says it's to bring people into the full measure or the full stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we all become more and more like Jesus Christ. Is that your desire today? Amen. Become more and more like Jesus Christ. Amen. To be more committed to him. Well, God has given the ministry to do that, to help with that. And that's their calling. And uh, we'll be to the, the pastor and the minister who does not do that. Because they're not fulfilling what God has asked them to do in order for the church to be what it needs to be. Finnis uh, uh, Dake said this, Many seek to find out how many imperfections failures and carnal traits are allowable in religion but few seek to bring Christians to the height of the gospel standard and to the unlimitations of the promises of God the measure of the stature of this fullness is seldom mentioned much less demonstrated while the statue of littleness emptiness powerlessness of Christianity is often emphasized and demonstrated no truer words were said. Most people say, what is, the, what is the minimum I can get by with? Rather than looking at the full stature of the measure of Christ. You see, we're called with a high calling. It's not a low calling. It's not a mediocre, call, a mediocre calling. It is the high calling in Christ. And each one of us have that call on our life to be more and more like Jesus Christ. Well, God has given the ministry to help us in that capacity to help us get down that road and I will say even those in the ministry are in their own journey into God Amen. and they ought to be growing and developing just like everybody else you know? what I understand about God today and what I understood about God 10 years ago is vastly different because my my understanding of the Lord has increased and expanded that should be true of each and every one of us. That what we understand about the Lord. You know, when he, you know, Paul said it. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I acted like a child. You know, there was behaviors. You can identify children. But he said, when I became a man, what did I do? I put away childish things. So, you know, as a church and a corporate, a corporate church, we'll have new youngins in the Lord who will act like youngins in the Lord. We don't cut them off. We don't kick them out. We don't say you can't come back here. We don't say, well, if you don't line up, you can't be a part of us. We don't do that. We understand that they're children in the Lord. They're going to behave like children. So what do adults do? They guide them. They teach them. They correct them. They bring them along. Because that's what you do. And uh, I always, I, I, I've always believed that, you know, the Word of God, it, it, the same God that saved them, that spoke to their life and saved them is the same God who's going to speak to them after they're saved. Amen. So I have full confidence in the Word of God to challenge people's lives and speak into their lives. There'll be opportunities for you and me as the people of God to encourage people, and we've dealt with that for a number of weeks. We're here to help people along in their journey. Not put them down, but help them along. And to encourage in them and to build them up and to challenge them and say, you can do it. You can set that addiction aside. Hello. Amen. You can. And I tell you what, I'm not just going to tell you you can. I tell you what, I'm going to give a day or two this week. I'm going to fast Amen. for you in that endeavor. Amen. See, that's what the church should be doing. Amen. Not pointing the finger and condemning them and saying, well, you know better than that. Of course they do. 
You don't have to tell them. But how different it is to point the finger at them and tell them you ought to be doing better and shame on you and to say, look, I know you're struggling with this, but I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to set aside a day this week and I'm going to fast and pray for you that God will help you and you will, you'll be open to the Lord's deliverance in your life because he will do that. See the difference? One is harsh and judgmental. One does nothing to help them. It's like criticism versus constructive criticism. Criticism is telling somebody you zig when you should have zagged. There's no remedy with that. Constructive criticism says, I see the problem here. How can I help? Far too many people look at the church and say, ah, you know, they should be doing this, that, and they have their long list of gripes and complaints and criticism. From the pastor on down. And all they do is criticize and negative. It's like Miriam and Aaron who criticized Moses for the for the woman he married. He said, You married an Ethiopian. We don't like that. God said, Well, let's come to the temple. I want all three of you to come. He smoked Miriam with leprosy, sent her out of camp. Couldn't do that to Aaron because he was a high priest. But reprimanded him strongly. And then in order for Miriam to be healed. She had to come back and have Moses pray for her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The very person she criticized. I think there's a little connection between that and what James says. Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The very person you don't like may be the very person that needs to pray for you so that you can be healed. The very person that may irritate you may be the one that God uses to bless you. Amen. That's right. You know, that's the way the Lord works. Well, let's go on. Uh, responsibilities toward God. The pastor has responsibilities toward the Lord. And um, the Bible tells us that the pastor is a watchman for the Lord, which carries with it a tremendous responsibility and accountability to whom much is given what much is required, much is required. so for those that God has gifted in this capacity in leadership and ministry gifts they ought to use those gifts like everybody else ought to use their gifts in a proper way and they have responsibilities to God and as the watchman it is a matter of life and death not only for his own soul or her own soul, but it is for the souls of those that are under, under the care. And it's no different whether you're standing behind a pulpit or you're a leader or a teacher in a classroom. Those little kids are the people you are shepherding for that time that you have them. Yeah. Amen. Those young people are under your care. You say, well, it's only 45 minutes a week. Well, they're under your care for 45 minutes. And we have to be diligent about how we we deal with that. Now, I was growing up in church. Here was our Sunday school class. We had a quarterly out of American Standard here in Cleveland. Everybody used them. And uh, we had a little quarterly. And so we all got in a circle the teacher passed around the quarterly and each one of us read a paragraph. And when we got through with that paragraph, we ran all the paragraphs of the lesson. I guess the teacher didn't bother to read the lesson until we did. And then we read the lesson and then at the end there were some questions about it. We answered those questions and that was our Sunday school class. And occasionally we would have uh, Bible memorization. That was probably the most productive. Some people will complain, well, we don't have this, that, and the other. Well, you have God. And I know sometimes it's not ideal. And that wasn't much of a teaching session for anyone. But we were in church. We were gathered together. And though very much imperfect, we were in the house of God, listening to maybe some people that weren't that prepared. We have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to you. 
Teachers, you have a responsibility to those who are under your care for that time. Teachers and leaders in the church, we have a responsibility for those that are under our care. God has gifted you and me with a responsibility. Here's what he says in Ezekiel, the third chapter. It's a, it's a, it really is a matter of life and death. He says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, this is the Lord, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. Yet, if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, <clears throat> when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at your hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that he that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. Well, the Lord is saying to those that are in leadership and ministry positions that you have a responsibility to preach the word. Amen. And we're not preaching our word. We're not preaching our opinion. We're preaching the word of God. So when the word of God says you must be born again, that's not my word. That's the word of the Lord. You must be born again. It's not a question. I'm not telling you my personal opinion. I'm preaching and giving warning for you to, to hear this. <clears throat> if you look at Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter, verses 1, again the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman if when he seeth the sword come upon the land he blow the trumpet and warn the people then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning if the sword come and take him away his blood shall be upon his own head he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered your soul. So you see the implication here? We who are in ministry and we who are in leadership positions, we have a responsibility to those that are under our care. And it's not our word that we're giving, we're giving God's word. And the Bible says we ought to do that with love and compassion. 
we ought to warn. Look, you can't, be, can't keep going down the dead end street that you're going. How's that working out for you? What's your life like? Are you satisfied? Are you happy? Do you have peace in your soul at night? See, we have to give warning. We have to tell the truth. We have to say, you know, love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Anything less is not loving God. It may be challenging. It may be sometimes difficult to hear. But folks, I, who in the ministry and those that are in leadership position, we're not only wanting to save your life, but we've got to save our own as well. And the only way that I can save my life is to tell you the truth. Right. And give warning from the scripture. He doesn't stop there. He says, therefore, O son of man, thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, if our transgressions and our sins be upon us, we pine away in them. How should we then live? Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Do you get the feeling of what God is saying here? He's telling, he's, he's communicating to Ezekiel the prophet, not only the message, but the depth of the feeling that he has. Can you just hear it in God's voice? Why will you die? Why oh, keep going down a dead end street? Why keep doing what you're doing? Why will you die? Why will you keep going on? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. For as the wickedness of the wicked, he shall fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sent it. In other words, you know, if you turn from the Lord, God doesn't wait out while you had five years of righteousness and you had three years of sinfulness. Eh, we'll, we'll go with this. No, God doesn't do that. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall be not remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that which he has robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live and he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Now, folks, here's the message with this. We all have messed up. We've all has failed. But God has always given us a remedy. And that is if we will confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Yet the children of thy people say the way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. They're just saying God, God's not just. He, you know, he's, he's not right. But when the righteous turneth from the righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, shall he shall live thereby. Yet you say... The way of the Lord is not equal or is not right. O house of Israel, I will judge you every one after his way. So he's telling us that uh, in this 33rd chapter, that there's a responsibility of those who are in leadership and those who are in ministry. To whom much is given and been gifted, much is required. And we have a responsibility to uh, share the word of God and the truth of God's word without fear or favor. And uh, that's one of the responsibilities. He doesn't stop there in the Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 17. He says, 
obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your soul as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you one of the biggest dangers of those who are in ministry and I have I have watched it over the years I even experienced some of it myself is the burnout factor <clears throat> you know Paul talked about he said you know the care of the church is my love for you and he's right for folks he says you know it's pretty heavy and there were times where you can tell in his writings he, he's dragging his feet a little bit um, and I think there are things that people that are in leadership especially in the church where you got 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. I remember when Meg and I went, first went to DeRitter, you had a church of 700, and you had about approximately five or six families doing a bulk of it. And they were on the thin edge of just burning out. And uh, my responsibility, or Meg and I's responsibility there, was to assist that pastor. Um, his gift... His gift was hugging all the babies and going by people's houses and drinking coffee. That was his gift. Administration was not his gift. Putting two, two together was not his gift. That was my gift. And so uh, by the time we, we left there, uh, two and a half years later, we had about 250 people that were involved doing various things in the church and helping it go forward without having burnout. We're, what I'm saying, folks, it takes everybody. Everybody fulfilling the calling of God on your life. God never called any of us to sit. He called all of us to serve. And we have a responsibility because it is. Now hear me as I close tonight. It is a life and death matter. Because we're talking about people's souls. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about people's lives and their homes and their families. And it does take each and every one of us doing all that we can, and especially doing what we're gifted to do. You say, well, I don't know what my gift is. Well, see me after church, and I'll help you find out what that is. You know, the Bible says what your hand findeth to do. Do it with all your might. That's where we start until you find out where it is you're going to fit. You know? We, uh, one of the courses I took at Cleveland State it was a, a course in uh, <coughs> different vocations and they, they uh, when you go into the military you take an assessment that determines basically your aptitude for certain things and so that's where that all started and of course they had some different assessments since then but during the course, they were, the, the, the instructor was showing us that uh, they went to this particular uh, dentist college. And they did this, uh, this aptitude and assessment on, on 2,000 prospective dentists. And they showed their personality traits for those that was going in. And then they thought, well, it would kind of be all over the place. But on the markers that they had for their personality trait, they were all pretty much the same. And they thought, well, you know, that's pretty interesting. So they came back three years later and did the same thing with a different class. And all their markers were still pretty much the same. People went into that field, had certain personality traits that led them to that field. And I suspect that's true with a lot of vocations. And yet in the kingdom of God, the Bible says you're not gifted according to your ability. God gives again. Now I'm sure He uses He uses personality. I mean, he, you, you have to see that. I mean, the Apostle Paul was was a bull in the china shop. He was going to get it done regardless, right? And uh, you needed somebody like with the personality of the Apostle Paul to do those missionary journeys and to endure the things that he endured. Someone with a more timid personality, like Timothy would not have been able to do that. So I do think God does look at our personal 
abilities and personality in some respects. But I also know that he gifts you and me with things that are outside our personality. I know you don't believe it, but I hated getting in front of people and talking. I hated giving book reports. When I was in high school, if it wasn't about a dog or a horse, I didn't give it. That was my book report. White Fang, Old Yeller, I mean, you, you just name it. That was my book report. And I did not like standing in front of people. I know that's strange to you now, but, uh, you know, God is able to equip you. If he calls you, he will equip you. So let me leave you with this tonight. Find out what it is that God wants you to do and then do it with all your heart. If you don't know what to do, start with what needs to be done and uh, give your time to it. And don't say, I, you know, I'm, I'm afraid I might mess up. Yeah, you're going to mess up. Just put that behind you. Everybody does. Yeah. But you keep doing it. And you keep trying. And you keep witnessing. And you keep talking to people. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy tonight. For your grace and your love to us. Have your way with our lives. Lord, use us for your glory.